Um, uh, for those of you that are continuing from the 101, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, getting started with developing with Couchbase. Um, a little bit more about me. I'm a technical evangelist at Couchbase. Um, I'm a polyglot hacker, uh, like lots of languages and like doing lots of different kinds of development. Um, during this presentation, uh, just for uh, readability, I, I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, Ruby often. Um, but you'll, you'll, you'll find that the syntax for other languages is quite similar. Um, Ruby just happens to be very easy to read on slides um, and it, uh, there's not as much code. But all the SDKs um, you know, have similar uh, syntax, etc. Um, and I hope you get a lot out of this presentation. I'm going to talk about a lot of different things. Um, so let's get started. So one of the first things you have to do after you uh, have installed Couchbase Server, um, like on your local machine, if you want to, you know, starting development, is to set up your SDK uh, for your particular preferred language. At uh, uh, Couchbase.com/communities, um, we have a, it's basically a portal um, with you know, resources for every language. Um, you know, we support Java and .NET, PHP, Ruby, Python, C, and Node.js. We also support some other languages. They're technically um, community clients. Um, Go, Erlang, Clojure, Tickle, and uh, no, there's some other Node.js ones in Perl. Um, on the Couchbase.com uh, slash community site, if you click on all clients on the left, you can get, you can scroll down and see uh, clients for those languages. Um, one of the most important things to, to know when you're setting up SDKs is that we have four, li four clients, uh, SDK clients, that um, are wrappers around a C library. And so for PHP, Ruby, uh, Node.js, and Python, they are all wrappers around the lib Couchbase C library. So you need to install the lib Couchbase C library first. Um, so in, in order to do that, you you can you know click on the C uh, library uh, on the, space, the community's portal, um, and you'll go to the C getting started, and it gives you instructions for each platform. Um, a few tips for Mac users, um, for Mac Rubyists, you already know this stuff, but make sure that you install Xcode and the command line tools within Xcode first. Um, install Homebrew if you don't use that already. Um, and do a brew update and upgrade in Doctor to make sure you're up to date with all your homebrew uh, recipes. So, for Windows, um, you download the appropriate zip file from the website corresponding to your Windows OS uh, and Visual Studio. Um, you know, for Mac, it's just a brew install of Couchbase if you've got the Xcode and command line tools and all that stuff set up. Um, um, for Red Hat and Ubuntu, it's a pretty classic. You get the yum or uh, apt-get uh, repository, and then you do the yum install or apt-get install for uh, those um, the libcache base uh, dev and, and libevent libraries. So that's how you install libcache base, and then you can follow the instructions for um, you know finishing up the installation for those libraries that require libcache base. For Java and .NET, um, for Java we have Maven rep repositories, so if you're using Maven or Gradle, uh, we have repositories for that, or you can download them um, directly from the website and include them in your project. Um, and for .NET we uh, use NuGet, um, and I guess that's the homebrew for Windows. Um, uh, and you know, very straightforward and similar. You can also again download the zip files and 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 deal with it that way. One of the first things you're going to want to do is actually connect to Couchbase. And making a connection to Couchbase is very simple. Uh, in Ruby here, I I'm connecting to a default bucket, you know, on my local host. Actually, if I just do Couchbase.new, it'll default to those values already. Um, in this case, I'm just creating a hash. I'm adding that with a key of my data, and and then I'm retrieving that back and outputting it to the console. Um, for Python, very similar. Um, we do support pickling objects, uh, pickle and 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 other things um, for serialization and deserialization, um, and it, it looks very similar to the Ruby uh, uh, connection uh, sort of routine. 
Java, as usual, is a little bit more verbose. In this case, I have a list of URIs, um, and then I pass that uh, to the cache uh, client. Um, in Java, unlike uh, Python and Ruby and Node.js, I actually specify a JSON transcoder. In this case, I'm using the Google JSON transcoder, but there are a number of other ones. There's about a, a dozen or so competing JSON um, uh, transcoders, like JSON Smart, etc. In this case, I'm using JSON. Um, I'm doing exactly the same operations as I'm doing in the Ruby and the Python, where I have a hash. In Java, I have a hash table, and I'm putting two, uh, you know, key values into the hash table, and then I'm, uh, you know, transcoding it and adding it with the key my data, and then I'm bringing it back out and I'm printing it out. Um, in this case, I actually didn't deserialize it because it's uh, uh, in back to a hash table, but I just printed it out. Um, so that's one important note for Java is you, you can actually specify your own transcoder. For .NET, um, I'm sorry, for Node.js, actually, JSON is a first-class citizen. Um, so there isn't any transcoding uh, done. Um, uh, so they're native objects. JSON is a native object to Node.js. Uh, very similar, I'm requiring the catchphrase uh, SDK, making a connection, um, creating a, a, a hash uh, dictionary, and then adding the data and pulling it back out. And PHP, again, very similar, and you get the picture. So making a connection to the catchphrase, this is pretty simply you know, how you do it in all these different languages. Um, and now I want to kind of talk about one of the first things that happens when you start development is kind of understanding the differences between what you've been doing for the last year, five years, ten years, or twenty years. Um, we're using relational databases and uh, using Couchbase. So as we all know, uh, relational databases represent data in rows and columns and tables. Um, each row of a table has a specific schema as of static types. You're specifying this when you're doing a create table. Um, when you need to change that schema, you need to take uh, your, your database down, do an alter table. If you have data that exists in that table, you might have to do a migration, and then you bring the relational server back up. Um, simple data types um, like strings and numbers and date times can easily be represented by columns. Um, however, Complex data types like dictionaries and hashes or uh, arrays or lists cannot be represented in a single table. And Martin Fowler, who's a famous writer and speaker um, and founder of ThoughtWorks, you know, called this impedance mismatch. Impedance mismatch is where your in-memory data structures um, don't match your uh, on-disk data structures. So in memory, you have like uh, an object that contains like a, a list of you know, user preferences or a dictionary of uh, product spot or whatever it is. And on disk, you actually have to break that object apart into pieces. Um, and that's what he calls impedance mismatch. Um, all rows, you know, within the table have identical schema. So if you have things that are sort of optional, so maybe you have users that can have multiple addresses. Um, you might have to make additional columns that are mostly filled with nulls. So you have, you know, address one, you know, street one, city one, you know, state one, and then you have address two, street two, city two, you know, et cetera. Um, and, you know, this also, when you have a running application, um, especially if it's, you know, a mature application, Getting and making these schema changes can be very problematic. Um, you know, taking the database down means your your users have to see a message saying, "Oh, we'll be back at some point." Um, you have to do you know plan all these migrations and bring the servers back up. Um, you know, this can be very problematic at times. Um, you know, you're also when you take your application down, you're also if, you know if you're an e-commerce system, you're losing money. If you're you know if People see downtime, they, they might reflect on your brand, you know, um, hey, this site's having problems, when actually you're just adding a column. Um, you know, and reading, writing, and transaction require mutex and locking. 
And that's how uh, relational systems have worked um, for all these years. And um, its design is based on, um, you know, when it when relational databases came out, it was actually to conserve disk space and re to remove redundancies of data uh, because, uh, you know, hard drive space was at a massive premium, um, you know, in the 70s. Gigabyte was like $700,000. You know, now it's in a fractions of cents. Um, and so redundancy of data and this design um, isn't as applicable. You know, disk, disk space is cheap. What we're looking for these days is performance um, and speed over disk space. Um, in Couchbase, um, because it's a key value document store, you can and it's using JSON, you can re also represent simple data types, numbers, date times, Williams, etc. Binary data can be stored, restored as um, base64 encoded strings. But you and you can also represent um, dictionaries and hashes and arrays and lists. Um, if you're new to JSON, it's you know very similar to XML, but with a much lighter weight syntax. So um, you know you can you can store all these complex data types. So you can store your objects and all its complexity in JSON and serialize and deserialize it, um, which is a, a strong advantage. So you don't have to split out your lists and hashes into different tables and do joins. Um, in this case, you're talking about JSON documents. And JSON is basically just a special class of string. It's you're storing a string. It's a special class of string that Couchbase recognizes and can do things like create uh, map produce indexes for and things like that. Um, in Couchbase, there is no enforced schema. Uh, it is an implicit schema based on your model layer of your application. You're in programmatic control of your schema. Um, there is an implicit schema um, always because data exists and data has a structure, um, but that structure can change. It can, it can vary from document to document. So in the user and their multiple addresses example, um, you might have uh, user one has just one address field in JSON, and then user two has two addresses, um, and it's basically a list of addresses, an array of addresses, um, and, and that, so that those documents can vary from um, document to document. Uh, which is very powerful. You can also change your data dynamically on the fly without taking Couchbase down. So you can have sort of a dynamically generated schema uh, as you're collecting information about the user, you're populating your JSON with more and more information. Um, it makes it more agile for development because as you're developing your application, as you're developing your model, you can make these changes uh, extremely fast without having to do migrations and alter tables and create all this code and work uh, for creating schema um, you can simply just you know store uh, more fields in your in your JSON document you know just from your application logic just from your model and your classes alone um, you can do that 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 pose it, it creates a major advantage for creating applications because it speeds things up considerably also if you're doing integrations with Facebook or Twitter, which is quite common with social login, they're giving you JSON and you can just store that JSON straight into Couchbase without creating a very complex nested schema and complex you know, storage of tables and uh, many tables and joins, etc., just to store you know, social uh, data. Um, that's a, a, also another great advantage. You save a lot of time not having to create that schema. Uh, you can literally you know, take the JSON from Facebook and stuff it into Couchbase uh, without any work. Um, so it makes things really fast. So here is sort of reiterating the example. Um, you know, in this uh, user class in Java, I have the array list and the hash table and a array list of certain type of books. And this can't be represented in a single table. I can't just put this into a user table. I have to have multiple tables and joins. And some important keys and some logic for being able to store and retrieve this. Um, you know, as long as you have simple types, it's very easy in, in relational systems. But once you get into complex types, it, it gets more hairy. And often we use ORMs to kind of disguise all this uh, from us programmatically, so we don't have to deal with it. But then optimizing uh, the queries, etc., generated by ORMs is a little bit more tricky, and ORMs themselves are a bit slow. Um, so you're not getting the same performance. 
you know, cache space for this exact same example. Here I have a document, you know, with the exact same information. So I can represent that user object, you know, directly into a cache based document using JSON. Uh, in this case, I also included a, what I call a doc type. It's just a JSON key which I specify the class in which, um, this is sort of a side note, the, uh, the class that generated this uh, document. And often and that's a that's a convention. Some people call it type, or some people call it doc type. Some people call it class. It, it's just a JSON key that includes the object in which um, which uh, generated this document, which is useful in views, which is um, part of Catchbase 103 on Monday. Uh, we're going to talk about views. Uh, just wanted to mention a little side about that doc type key in the uh, JSON there. Some of the benefits of JSON. Uh, as I was saying, it was that you can rep represent complex objects and data structures. It's a very simple notation, lightweight. It's very readable. I think one of the great things about JSON over XML, um, while they're both flexible, JSON is far easier to read. Um, it's also the most common API return type for integration. So Facebook, Twitter, you name it, almost everyone returns JSON. So that makes it very useful to have your database uh, uh, understand and uh, understand JSON as well and makes your application development faster. Um, it's also native to JavaScript, which can be really useful for lots of applications that are using you know, Angular or, 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 or these MVC JavaScript frameworks um, where you, you're passing in JSON and it's responding to different uh, keys within your JSON um, you know, and dynamically updating the page or you're sending data back and forth as JSON, it's very useful um, to have JSON all the way through. And then serialization and deserialization of objects into JSON is very fast. It's only getting faster There's, because it's, JSON is so popular all around. Um, these uh, transcoders are just getting faster and faster. So let's talk a bit about the operations within Couchbase. So this is the storage and retrieval operations. You, you can, you know, remember it's a sort of a key value store structure. So it's like a dictionary or hash table. There's a key and then there's the value of the key. So in this case, when we're doing a get, we're retrieving a document. We retrieve entire documents. We do not do partial documents. So you're getting based on the key. And then when you're storing, we've got three different methods, uh, set, add, and replace. Um, they're actually quite similar. Um, add and replace are just sets with conditions. So add expects the, the key to not exist and it'll raise an error exception if it does. Um, and replace it's, expects the document to exist um, and then you're replacing it and returns an error exception if it doesn't exist. Those two are actually, I use them far more often than the set because set will always overwrite even if it exists. Um, so I use add and replace because within my application logic, I I want to know whether I this document should exist already or doesn't exist yet, um, and I use add and replace to kind of almost uh, if if I have an exception where I'm creating a new user and that user exists already, I might have a flaw in my logic. So I find that um, add and replace are more useful um, than set. Um, CAS is a compare and swap. Uh, um, and basically, it's an optimistic concurrency uh, where you can only change the document if it hasn't changed while, um, you know, if the CAS value hasn't changed. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. Um, so, lock a document, um, and that's the pessimistic concurrency, and then you can unlock it um, on a set at a replace. Uh, or you can unlock it without doing it uh, using an unlock method. We do have atomic counters in Cashbase, and they're extremely useful um, for games and things like that of, of that nature, where there's some sort of transactional, um, you know, points or scores. Um, you know, atomic counters are useful. They're useful for a, a number, a couple of different key patterns, which we're going to talk about. Um, and so there's incur and decker, which is increase, decrease, um, very simple, and they're executed, always executed in order atomically on uh, Couchbase server itself, so um, you can guarantee their order, which is uh, excellent. It, it's, it's one of the distinguishing properties of 
space of why so many gaming companies use this uh, is because of our atomic counters. There are a few uh, non-JSON operations. I call them non-JSON operations because they're basically dealing with strings. Um, Prepend and ap append uh, are the two operations there, and you can kind of do interesting things with them, uh, create lists uh, with delimiters, um, things like that. If you want quick lists and you don't necessarily need JSON, uh, you can actually create quick lists with append and prepend. Um, and what it does is actually prepend it in in Cowspace itself, it's a native operation. So, um, as you can see by the example there, I added the brown fox to jumped over the lazy dog, um, or I created a list of um, you know fruits, and I can add that. So there are some creative uses for these uh, non-JSON operations, uh, not as frequently used, but there are some creative things you could do. Um, also, uh, you know, Cowspace supports explorations. So for every document, you can set an expiration. Obviously, CacheBase, since it evolved from memcached to membase to CacheBase, it still supports all the caching uh, operations you would do in memcached uh, um, You can do it with CacheBase and actually have even higher performance because it's distributed, uh, distributed cache. Um, so with every, um, oh. Oh, I have a slide out of order. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, so with every <laughs> expiration, um, sorry, so with, with every operation, you can add a TTL value, and, um, you know, obviously Couchbase will handle that, um, you know, automatically. So if you create a document with a 30-second TTL, you know, after 30 seconds, if you try and get that, it'll, it won't exist anymore. Um, also, a lot of CMS frameworks uh, can be configured to use CacheBase for caching. You know, we uh, our Ruby gem, for instance, it's just a very simple setting in the uh, cache settings to use CacheBase. Um, uh, you know, for all your caching in Rails. Um, uh, if if your uh, CMS system supports memcached, uh, you can use that as well with CacheBase. CacheBase supports the memcached protocol. Um, and of course, if you want to update that uh, expiration, you can do a touch operation. So we, there's there's creation, and then there's touch. Um, if you want to update um, and increase the expiration, and I'll go back. And this was supposed to be up in the concurrency of CAS. So let's talk about CAS uh, real quick. The compare and swap. So every storage operation um, creates what's called a CAS value. It's just a long integer that re represents its current state. Um, so when you do an operation, it creates a CAS value, and you know that's its current state. When you do another um, storage operation, like set, add, replace, or touch, it'll change the CAS value uh, to a new value. This allows you to uh, utilize that value um, for optimistic concurrency. So in this example here, it's kind of like a version number, but we don't have versioning in Couchbase. Um, you can use a key value pattern to do versioning and keep multiple versions of documents, but we don't have uh, versioning built into Couchbase. So in this example here, I'm doing a get. Um, this is a Ruby syntax. I'm doing a get. I'm getting the document value, the flags, and the CAS value. And when I want to replace that document, um, I'm sending back the CAS value um, that I have. And if another process has changed that document between my get and my replace, that CAS value will not match. And therefore, I know that another, uh, you know, I've had a race condition and another um, process has updated that document. And so that replace will fail. And so then I can know that I need to try it again. I need to try my replace again and do a new get and a new replace. And this allows you to do, um, you know, handle race con conditions gracefully. Uh, without locking documents, um, um, and it's generally faster than locking documents. We do support actual lock uh, if needed, um, and the general recommendation is only use it if you need to. Um, um, if you can use CAS instead, it's just you know generally faster. Um, anytime you're locking on a server, um, whether it's relational or couch based, you know you're increasing uh, latencies uh, in general. So. Um, if you can use CAS for concurrency, and generally speaking, this is good enough for most situations. 
Um, in relational systems, we, the reason you have transactions um, primarily came from the fact that you have to do normalization. Uh, normalization means you have to break out your data into lots of tables, and then if you want to update, you're going to have to update uh, in multiple locations and in multiple tables. If you don't have transactions, you have the potential for disaster. Um, but because data is generally more denormalized in Catchbase, um, you more often are only updating single documents, and this is where optimistic concurrency works really well. Um, so, what's that? Um, and we also have some durability operations. Um, and this is, you know, again, one of those things that um, if you have durability requirements in your SLA, uh, we have this uh, observe um, on uh, storage operations um, where it'll call back when it's been written to disk on the active partition, or it can call back um, when it's been written to replicas, or and or it can be called back when it's been written to multiple replicas or single or multiple replicas on and gotten to disk on those replicas. Um, which is like the highest level of uh, uh, durability. You, you know, it does take time for um, you know if you're gonna if you need to wait until it's on disk on a replica. You know, you're increasing the amount of time before that calls back. Just to understand, uh, you don't necessarily want to use this for every single operation. You only want to use it where that durability is absolutely necessary um, to know that it's actually made it to disk or replica or both. And the syntax here is, uh, you know, in Ruby, I show Ruby and Java here, is here I'm observing um, the first example. I, you know, I want to I want to know that it's been persisted to disk under the active partition and replicated in this case, you know, saying, you know, it's persisted to one and it's also replicated to another. Um, in Java, uh, it's using enums, so it's per persisting to master and replicate to one. Um, if I only wanted to observe replication only, um, and that's enough for my durability requirements, you know, uh, there you can see the slight difference in syntax there. Um, so this is very useful for um, operations that require durability, and you want to ensure that it's made it to, um, uh, you know, the master or active partition and replica, or made it to disk, etc. So I'm going to talk about a few basic key patterns that are uh, used often in Catchbase. Um, so as, as I was introducing before, where typically this is the routine that you're doing. You're, you have a user object um, with fields. You're serializing it to JSON. You choose a key. Like in this case, I chose uh, user uh, u colon colon uh, just deep at Catchbase.com is my key. Um, because maybe in my site I'm logging in with my email address, um, and there's a, there's a JSON document with all my uh, fields. I'm adding it to Couchbase, and then when I do the login uh, and type in my uh, email address, you know I know the key of that document. So then I do a get on that key, um, which is the email address, and um, I get the JSON back and I deserialize it back into a user object. And this is kind of the standard workflow that you're doing with Couchbase. Um, you're, you know, serializing your objects into JSON, uh, storing Couchbase, and then when you retrieve, you retrieve back JSON and deserialize back into your object. So there are different ways of thinking about keying. You know, keying, keys have to be unique within the bucket. So generally, they are typically unique values uh, within your application, so like email addresses or usernames, you know, and only one person can have a particular username, um, SKUs or ISBNs. So in this case with users, you know, it's fairly common to use, um, you know, email address or usernames. Um, there's an example for products. When you have predictable keys, so for, for instance, like using the email address, so I'm logging into the, your, my, your application with an email address. And um, so now I know what the key is going to be for the document. Uh, so I can actually do a get on that key and say, well, check if this exists in, in Couchbase, you know, user colon colon just deep at couchbase.com. So with predictable keys, um, you can do a, a lot of different things. It makes it actually easier um, to develop. Um, 
when you use things that are less predictable, uh, like unique keys, like UUIDs or GUIDs, um, you're going to require it's going to require views. It's going to require indexes because those keys will not be predictable. So if I create a user with a user uh, UUID, um, when I log in with my email address, I'm going to have to figure out what that UUID is for that user. Um, and there's actually a t-value pattern that you can use for that. And I'm just, just describing that uh, in a minute. It's called the lookup pattern. So first I want to talk about a counter ID pattern. And that counter ID pattern is using an atomic counter combined with um, a key. So in the first step, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, incre incrementing the counter. And so let's just say the value of the counter was one. You know, I'm, this, I'm the second user coming in. So now I increment it and the value is two. And then I use that as a component of the key. So then when I add the data to Couchbase, I do, you know, your key, you know, the string value plus that ID, plus the number two. Um, and then I have basically what's sort of a list. So it could be, you know, a list of users. And I'll, I'll show you an example real quick. And then when I want to iterate through that collection, since I know the total count of that collection, which is that uh, atomic counter, I can get that count and I can actually iterate through the collection if needed. So this can be used for users, but it can also be used for things like comments on a blog or, you know, uh, a list of to-do items or yeah, it can be used as a list. And the atomic counter is keeping track of the number of items and then the value of the atomic counter is used as a component of the key. So then I have predictable keys. I have comment colon one, comment colon two, comment colon three, and each of those is a document. It's similar to an identity um, in uh, relational databases, um, except we're using an atomic counter and using, uh, you know, uh, that atomic counter value as part of a key. So I'm, it's a it's a pair of operations. It's incur and add. Um, so I'm incrementing the counter and then adding um, adding a document based on the value of that counter. So and and you can. See in this example here, it's the same thing as the previous slide. Here, the key is, you know, my blog is Couchbase, and I have a comment count, and I'm incrementing that comment count, and then um, I actually store the comment itself um, using that ID. Uh, lookup pattern allows you to actually create multiple ways to find a document. So in this case, I'm adding. Uh, First, I'm adding a document, and I'm actually using a UUID here, and I'm storing, you know, the user data. I, and that UUID, I'm actually creating two other documents that are lookup documents. So I'm adding um, my email address, and the only value of that document is actually, it's not in JSON, it's just a string, which just actually has the key of the main uh, document that has all the user data. And then I have another one that has the username, and the same key for the user document. So then retrieval takes two operations. First, I want to get the, you know, based on the email address down below, I want to get that key and say, okay, well, that was the key. That's, this is the key of my main user document, and then I get the main user document. So it takes two operations there. Um, yeah, and this is the lookup pattern. So you are you have a primary document, and then you have one or more lookup documents. And in this case, I'm using an email address. So in this case, you can also use UUIDs. You can also use, um, you know, GUIDs and random IDs, um, like Twitter Snowflake for, you know, uh, key generation, things like that. Um, the lookup documents aren't JSON. They're just simply the key value that uh, I'm going to be getting in the second operation. So it requires two get operations. First, get the lookup, then get the primary document. So here's kind of an example where I have a main user document. Um, you know, I have a user count using a, a counter, uh, the counter ID pattern. Then I have the main document that's actually using that key. Um, and then I have a number of lookup documents. I have Facebook ID, Netflix ID, Twitter ID, um, two different email addresses, and the username, all pointing to that um, uh, main user document. Um, so then for each of those cases, if I have multiple social logins, I can pull it up and then pull the main user document based on that uh, lookup pattern. 
So when you're combining them together, you know, when you create, you're going to create a, a number of documents depending on how many lookups you, you want to have. Um, you know, you're going to you know, increase the user count, you're going to use that ID for the main document, and then you're going to also store that ID um, with all the lookup documents. And then retrieval takes two operations. You know, you get the main key and then you get the main document. So there are some benefits to doing this. It's overall it's faster um, than having a large volume of uQueries um, because these are all binary operations. Gets and sets are extraordinarily fast. They're going to and from RAM, uh, so they're they're super fast. Um, you know you can create lots of different ways of getting to a document. Uh, it's always consistent, um, like all the other binary operations. Um, the other, I guess you could say the downside is that you're increasing the number of documents and therefore increasing the amount of metadata usage in RAM. But this is, you know, depending on the sizing in your cluster, this is probably a non-issue for most people. Um, you know, the, 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 you have plenty of space and you, if you, if you, you know, size your, your, your cache based cluster accordingly, it would be a non-problem. It really depends on your priority of performance over, um, over a sort of uh, metadata size. So the reiterating the same thing and, and basically I, on the right I'm showing the you know the counter ID plus lookup and then on the left it's kind of the equivalent of that is the you know ID with the primary key um, column you know for a user table in RDMS uh, RDBMS. So the relational version on the left and then Catchbase version on the right using uh, counter ID and lookup pattern. So one of the differences in terms of performance is you you, you might be thinking, uh, well, I'm using two get operations. I'm hitting the database twice, you know, uh, each time. And remember that this is coming out of RAM, so it's going to be extraordinarily fast um, binary socket. No matter what, no matter how many users I have, it's still going to be just two very very fast um, sub millisecond operations to get the user document. While in a relational system, I might have, you know, uh, you know, this giant table that keeps growing and growing, you know, where I can do these where clauses, and it gets slower for each request. The number of users, as my user uh, user base grows, it's going to get slower um, to actually find that um, find that user. Uh, so it's the difference is, is is sort of in terms of performance as your data uh, set increases in size. Cache space was, is going to stay the same, uh, no matter how many users you have. While relational is going to get slower and slower. Um, so you can also have multiple documents, and what I like to, what I recommend in, in general, is sort of aligning documents to behaviors so you can avoid race conditions. If you have all your data about a user in a single document, that means all different user behaviors within your site. Are all going to try and access or update the same document. So you can split up your your you know you can split up your user into multiple documents. You know where behaviors are aligned with um, you know with your application behavior. So your documents are sorry your documents are lined up with your application behaviors. So that when you're doing a particular thing, you're only updating you know a document that's relevant to a behavior. And this is sort of an extreme example where on the left I have all this data about a user and then on the right I've broken them out into all individual documents. Um, well that's not strictly necessary you know to, to, to do this in terms of behaviors. It can be useful because it can actually make things a little bit simpler for you as well. You know in terms of you know TD, BDD and writing small methods and keeping things you know really easy to understand. Um, you know, I, you know, like I was saying, it reduces the number of user actions that affect a single document. You have less chance of race conditions. Um, it does increase. You can, you're, you know, you again, just like the lookup pattern, you're increasing the number of documents in cache base, so that increases the metadata usage. But it could still be, you know, more useful in terms of maintenance of your code and understanding your application. It can help with any potential uh, race conditions, etc. And so it encourages smaller, simple methods that you know are easier to maintain. 
so one of the first sort of adjustments that, that I went through when I moved from relational to Couchbase is that I, I always had this sort of fear of, uh, of my uh, relational database not being able to handle things as it grew. Um, and, I, and you try and optimize to, to, to hit the, the database as little as possible um, because you know that those joins are expensive and then you need to cache the results. And, you know, even, even with that and indexing tricks, you know, um, you know, relational gets bogged down by complex joins and, you know, huge indexes. Um, but with Couchbase, the gets and sets are so fast. They're coming, you know, going and coming from RAM um, over binary socket. They're so fast that they're trivial. So it's, it's quite common to do multiple gets um, and, and sets. It is, it's not something that you need to feel that you need to avoid. Um, the performance is so high and is so fast. There's no computation required to return that data. So um, I think that uh, you know it, it, it's one of the things that I had to get used to when I started getting uh, into Couchbase. So um, I wanted to actually uh, stop for questions. Actually, uh, I've gotten I've been talking. I've been on a roll here. Well, I'll finish with this one idea. So on the left here, you've got this very you know complex join. Now on the right, you have sort of more simpler operations that are easier to understand. And instead of generating these really complex queries uh, in SQL, you can actually have much more simpler um, sort of application logic to, to retrieve and store data. Um, so uh, let's take a, a few minutes uh, uh, to answer some questions, and then I'll keep on rolling. Yeah, let's, uh, we have a... Um... Let's do a couple of questions now, and then we can complete the presentation. Um, so the first question is, is there a batch insert update operation that will call back with a list of failed insert updates after the write to primary disk? And maybe I can repeat the question if it's too long. Yeah, it, I, I, are you saying a uh, multi-set operation? Yeah, the question is, is there a batch insert update operation that will call back with a list of failed insert updates after the write to primary disk? Um, that depends on the SDK. I believe that the Ruby SDK and maybe the Python one implemented a, a multi-set type operation. Um, but with observe, uh, you know, I'd actually have to check on that, um, that particular one for multi-storage plus durability combined. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that, uh, that uh, that's actually in all the SDKs. Um, I know you can do multi-sets in those two, um, but I'm not sure about also including durability requirements for each one. Um, but that's a good question. Uh, that's not as common a, a request. <laughs> Um, and uh, as a reminder, Just Deep has a blog where he will answer all the questions that are asked during these sessions. And uh, so every every week you can see on his blog all the questions and answers from Couchbase uh, training series. So you, uh, we can point them, we can point you to his blog, and you can go and see the detailed answer. Um, we have uh, another question. Um, is uh, going back to the um, to the adjustment from re moving from relational to NoSQL. So you said with um, with Couchbase, you don't have to go back and change the schema. But what if you have to update the, the schema on multiple documents? How can you add a new field on multiple documents at the same time? Um, oh, OK. So what is the strategy for uh, sort of uh, uh, migrating migrating and adding a field to each of your documents. If it needs to exist in every document, like you're, you're going to add a field and value to every document, um, there's basically two ways of going about it. One is doing it on demand, meaning you modify your, um, your application model, your classes, to, to add it when it retrieves a, a document. Um, uh, at Zynga, for instance, they you know they often had to do this, and what they did was actually have a document version number as a JSON key, um, and so any documents that have you know don't have that new JSON key where it was an older version, and when they added it, they would you know change the version number of the document. 
Uh, then you can do like a cron job type deal where you actually go through and modify all the documents. You can also create like a view index that looks for a version, a uh, particular version of document and then modifies it. So there's a, there's a, uh, a number of ways of going about that. There are different strategies. If you need it all done at once, that's sort of creating a job that does a, that goes through the documents and adds a particular you know JSON key or modifies it. Um, and then if you can do it on demand, meaning you know when a user logs in, you're going to add a new field. Um, when you store that uh, back, you know you can do it that way. Uh, so those are generally the two strategies for dealing with it. Great. Uh, so let's complete the presentation. Then we have a few more questions, so we we're going to address them at the end of the, the session. Right. Okay. So an another a mental adjustment is getting used to the ideas, idea of keys and values, and that these keys can actually be very creatively used um, to make them predictable, um, and so you know what document to look up uh, using sort of a pattern that you create. Um, you know, I talked about two different patterns there, but there's you know an unlimited you know, amount of creativity in terms of, you know, key value patterns. Um, most newcomers see views as kind of SQL-like and you want to create views for everything um, to avoid, you know, key value patterns or thinking about it that way. But views are not going to be as performant as binary operations, uh, especially when you get large volumes of, of, of view queries for every single um, operation, you know, or action the user is taking on your application. Um, I, I think that you know often you can you know use key value patterns, and I'm not against views. I think you should use key value patterns when they're possible, and use views for when they're not possible. Um, views definitely satisfy a number, a large number of use cases where key value pattern is not possible. Um, and I think that's another sort of mental adjustment of kind of understanding the balance between key design and views. Um, I, <laughs> I already got to the Q and A. So I, I was almost done, my bad. <laughs> I do want to kind of talk about really quickly, since we just answered a few questions, um, a few resources. You know, there's the you know, main you know, language-based uh, resource portal, and that's catchbase.com slash communities. Um, there is a, a great repo that we created when we were traveling around and doing developer days, uh, github.com slash catchbase lab slash developer day. It actually has a step-by-step guides uh, for each language, you know, going through all the different operations that I talked about, um, kind of get familiar, kind of get your feet wet with operations, kind of see what it looks like in the syntax, etc. And then, of course, if you need help, uh, you can go to the Couchbase Q&A um, and ask a question there. Of, of course, we always, you know, monitor Stack Overflow as well. And, and feel free to send me an email at justdeepatcouchbase.com or hit me up on Twitter and I'd be more than happy to help you with questions. Uh, like Franco said, I'm, I'm every week on, I think on Friday for each week's um, uh, uh, webinars, I'm going to kind of list out questions that were asked and maybe have, if I, if I didn't have a detailed enough answer, you know, uh, verbally uh, during the webinar, I'll, I'll have more detailed answers um, uh, on the blog, and, you know, also for other people to kind of refer to them. Um, and not to forget, on Monday, I'm going to do the next uh, uh, Couchbase training, and it's going to be all about views and MapReduce and indexes um, and view queries. And that'll be on Monday, uh, October 14th at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. So, uh, Franco, are there more questions that didn't get addressed that uh, I can answer right now? Yes. Thank you, Justin. And as just Steve just said, again, we have uh, next Monday Couchbase uh, 103 about views and queries and indexes. So if, if you're curious about that, just uh, register, and I put the link on the chat box for anyone who hasn't registered yet. And next Thursday, we will have Couchbase 1 Couchbase uh, on a different application. Uh, we will have more details about that, and this is going to be our uh, session every week on Monday and Thursday we will have uh, uh, this free training. So let's go to the questions. Um, so we, we have a question from Teofra. Uh, what happens when we are storing pictures? So so far we have talked about uh, storing date and string, but what if you have to store images or other, other binaries? 
Ah, uh, not a problem at all. And actually, a lot of people um, do that with Couchbase. Uh, you can actually embed it. So there's two different ways of doing it. You can make them their own sort of documents with binary data. The the binary data will get Base64 encoded. Uh, so it does add a little bit of size to your disk storage and RAM usage, um, but it, you you can use Base64. Um, uh, or it is encoded base 64 and you decode it when you uh, retrieve it out and base 64 encode decode is, is very fast um, and or you can actually embed it by base 64 encoding it yourself um, and embed it in a JSON document which people do like say a profile picture for instance uh, you know I guess there's sort of a balance between you know it's coming from RAM you know there's a balance between you know using s3 or something um, or some other you know CDN type deal or you know using it in Couchbase, you will get some performance increase with Couchbase uh, because you'll you'll be you know getting it uh, from RAM, um, and I don't think S S3. I think S3 pretty much always comes off disk. Uh, you know you know so it kind of depends on your application and, and, and you know how many different people are going to be accessing it and from where. You know when you're using the CDN, you know obviously they optimize for geo. Uh, which can be advantageous as well. Um, so that's basically how it works. And you actually can create views and, and map reduces on uh, Base64 data, which is kind of interesting. I can show an example of that on Monday. Great. Uh, another question from Alvino. Um, so how can I make a query with multiple parameters to pass like name, date, and status? Uh, can you repeat that again? Yes. Um, how can I make a query with multiple parameters to pass like name, date, and status at the same time? Well, that's uh, so. I didn't talk about querying. So with with the map reduce and the views, the view indexes, that's where you would be doing querying. Uh, what I was generally talking about here is storing JSON data. So it's a key value um, style data storage. So there's a key and there's a value. Uh, you can use a pattern uh, like the lookup pattern uh, to be able to look up a document based on different values, but then you have to have a lookup document for each value that you want to look up the primary document by. So if I go back to that uh, slide again, you know, in this case I have, you know, I want to be able to look up, this is my primary document, which is the user data, and this is JSON, this is all my, you know, user data in JSON. You know, but I also want to be able to look it up by email address um, since I used a um, I used a you know UUID style ID here uh, for the key. I want to be able to look up that key by email address. So here I create a document which the value is actually only the key of the primary document, and then here I can look it up by username, and the value is only the key of the primary document. So I take two operations. Um, that's using the lookup pattern. So I I don't I'm not sure if I understand your question exactly um, because all that data is within a document um, you can either use views or you can use lookup patterns and key value patterns um, so that, that's kind of the difference between the two uh, scenarios I hope that kind of helps you uh, thank you just and uh, if there are uh, if the user wants additional uh, clarification you can email uh, directly just deep at just deep at couchbase.com yeah um, the other question we have is so how SQL update operation is done in Couchbase? Uh, like if I want to update a field in a table which is affecting many rows in other table? Well, there are no tables in Couchbase. So <laughs> uh, if you're saying that you know you have you're updating a document, you use the replace operation. Now, if you want to also um, update other documents um, at the same time, you can do there's two ways of doing it. One is you're iterating through and ensuring that you replace you know, data on each document um, or you can do what's called a two-phase commit and if you if you google that there's a there's a uh, it's couch base two-phase it's it takes a little bit of time to describe this but you're you're basically doing a process of, of uh, and this is a good blog post for you know or this is from our docs of how to approach modifying multiple documents you're kind of creating a transaction document um, that can kind of simulate transactions 
Um, it's not exactly the same, but you know, if you read this, you can kind of get the idea of it. Um, but generally speaking, since your name data is more denormalized, uh, you know, it's not separated out as much as in relational systems. You can modify documents, you know, just through doing a replace operation. Uh, yeah, I hope that answers it enough. <laughs> Again, you can email me just like uh, if you if you need more detail or you you, you want to ask you know follow up questions on that, you know, feel free to like email me uh, and I can I can kind of talk about it a little bit more with you. Thank you, Justip. Um, so we are out of time for today. Just a last reminder is uh, for those of you who uh, are interested in mobile, next Tuesday we'll have our webinar about introducing Couchbase Lite, which is our new product uh, um, for mobile uh, application and is in beta right now and available for download. We will have uh, the first introductory webinar on Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. So I invite all of you to register from our website. Uh, it's going to be a great session as well. Uh, with this, uh, I want to thank you all for attending Couchbase 102, and I hope to see you next Monday at Couchbase 103. Thank you. Thank you for coming. See you.